Okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Mason Porter, who's professor at the Department of Mathematics at UCLA. And uh, he, he has been a very prolific researcher in network science and complex systems and in other areas. And today he'll uh, speak about opinion models of social influence on networks. So please, Mason. Okay, yeah, so thank you very much for the, um, for the invitation. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I have a shortened version of the title on the slide here. Um, and then you can find me at my name on Twitter. And otherwise, let's just go ahead and get started. Okay, so one of the things that, um, you know, now is in our faces all the time is the spread of fake news on social media. And just to show you the shirt I'm wearing today, so I've got some fake news on my, on my shirt. Um, I actually bought that at a math conference, interestingly enough. Um, this, this character over here is actually, and they pronounced it with a hard G, Gary Gnu is an old character from a, from a TV show. Um, and and um, yeah, so it's an excuse to show Gary Gnu when I talk about fake news. Um, this is a sable, not a new. Um, okay, and then, you know, Kind of related, and this is a comic that was that showed up. This cartoon showed up uh, three weeks ago or something. I forgot which newspaper. And there's now there's now a fifth horseman, the misinformation horseman. Um, you know, so it really feels like it's sort of at this level that that we you know it's an important problem to try to solve. And I tend to think about these problems in a very abstract way, in a very simplified way in mathematical modeling, in terms of you know how do you model propagation of stuff on a network in the first place, or how do you model how opinions change in a network in the first place, right? So that's, that's one particular approach. And then there are, there are others who take more empirical approaches. But, you know, hopefully you get some insights into how these things spread, and then eventually to hopefully find ways to mitigate them. These comics are nice as well. But you know, you kind of are laughing, at least I'm laughing to keep from crying when I when I when I see stuff like this. Um, okay, so what I want to do is that I want to, you know, do a sort of whirlwind tour of a couple different styles of model. And there are different styles. They, they, you know, the things that they can do are different from each other. The things that they can't do are different from each other. And there are more than these three styles that exist. But, but I just want to sort of, you know, indicate, you know, some things that people spend their time on and, and, and show particular examples from those styles. So I'm going to show examples from my own work, but really the important part is the different styles themselves and the different ways that people think about these problems. You know, not, you know, so, so I'm showing some stuff from my work more for concreteness rather than because those specific things have any special importance over anybody else's work. Um, and so the three types that I'm going to discuss, one type goes by the name of, of threshold models. Uh, one type goes by the name of voter models. And in particular, I will discuss a variety that's, that's adaptive or co-evolving. This means that the states of the entities are coupled to how the entities are connected. So, so like if you're if you're sick, then you stay home, and so the network connections are different while you're sick. Um, and what are called bounded confidence models, which uses um, there's a mechanism called the bounded confidence mechanism that comes from social social psychology that gets used in how these are formulated. All right. So these are three styles of things, and I just want to give a flavor of some of the types of things that people think about. Okay. So. So, all right, so we've got social network, um, a node, so a node's an agent or an individual or whatever, it's not always an individual, but we can think of them for many of these as individuals. And then there are different types of edges or links or ties between them. And, and these, you know, there can be types that represent one or more different types of social connections, right? So all these things are present at once in principle. So you can interact offline, you can have a phone call, you can have Facebook friendships in the sense of actually just physically being physically, but being connected on Facebook. Um, you can have actual interactions on Facebook, you can have Twitter followership, you can have interactions on Twitter, right? So some of these are interactions, some of these are, are just kind of available means of communication and, you know, there's various things that get mixed together. And different things can propagate on different types of networks, right? Which is, which is now something that I think, you know, we all knew was true before, but it's probably the case that it's more appreciated, maybe appreciate is not the right word, 
we get stressed out from it now, but yeah, but it's something that's in our face and we that, that, that's affecting our lives, you know, very substantially. Um, and so things like information spreading, you know, online or offline and disease spreading offline only, right? And a lot of our, you know, a lot of our policies in terms of stay at home orders and so on reflect the fact that different things spread over different types of networks. Um, when you're studying a social network or some process on a social network, it's often very convenient to use a mathematical model of it. And, and these tend to have a mixture of regular and random structures. And I put random in quotes because, you know, random might represent not necessarily literal randomness, but an uncertainty. And so in a mathematical formulation of generating such a network, we, 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 we use some random process to reflect that. And, and so, you know, when you're trying to think of, say, a propagation of something on a network constructed from empirical data, as a good baseline of comparison, having a, a random a network from a random graph model, you know, that preserves certain properties is, is a convenient baseline. And then this also motivates the studies of those models for their own sake. Okay, so a general question that people ask, and um, James Gleason and I have written a short book on it, short books, so it's like 72 pages or something, short. Um, how does network structure affect some process on top of it? Okay, so it is incorporating who is interacting with whom via these ties, via edges. And so you get a dynamical process on a network. And so a basic question is how does network structure affect dynamics and vice versa? And so this booklet is meant to be an introduction to that topic um, for people who have not studied it before, maybe have some background in dynamical systems, but 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 it's 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 self-contained, but many, maybe, you know advanced undergraduate or introductory graduate level, but it's self-contained if you're interested in it. Okay, I'm not gonna go through this slide in full details, but I do wanna make a certain point and that's why I'm including it. And there's one short chapter of the book I just mentioned that goes through it in more detail. Um, when I have a process that occurs on a network, if, if for example, my network structure is not changing in time, then I am making a statement about the relative time scales of, of how the nodes change their state versus how the network structure changes, okay? And, and in these, these relative time scales are not always stated explicitly when people are writing papers, which can be a little bit of an issue. But so, so if I say I have a disease model that propagates on a network structure and the structure is constant, you know, I, I may well be saying that the, the, the states of the nodes, whether they become sick or not, is changing faster, for instance, than the structure of the network. And then there's a more extreme situation that if things are changing too fast, maybe you can only trust statistical properties. So there's, there's some nuances here. But the idea is, is that there are different timescales involved and that's going to affect whether you want the states to change in your model, whether you want the network structure to change in your model, or whether you want them to be coupled together. Okay. So moving a little bit more directly in, into the main topic of our discussion, um, spreading and opinion models. And they're actually a bit different from each other. And so I'm you know, sort of suggesting in the title that they're, you know, they're, they're sort of they're part of a similar ecosystem, but there's some differences. Um, there are lots of types of these models and the main goal of my talk is to introduce three of them and then to use some of my work to just illustrate you know, what one thinks about when studying a model of this type. And one type of model is known as a threshold model. Um, and so this type of model has discrete states, you know, say uninfected and infected. And there can be more than two, but most models that have been studied have two states. And it will model things like a social reinforcement in a spreading process in a really minimalist way. So the idea is that you don't necessarily change your state because you got infected by an individual person, but many, maybe many people around you are infected. And so those reinforce each other. So the term infected is being used for simplicity. Think of it as like um, buying a new product or you know, starting to wear masks or, or whatever. And then another type of model is known as a voter model. Um, it's not really a model for voters. There's one paper about that, um, but the name stuck. This has discrete valued opinions and it has a rule for the opinions to change. But, but, it does, but, but, but the changes are actually occurring when you're say considering um, a pair of nodes at a time. 
So I'll, I'll, I'll bring up more detail about that later. And then another type of model, the other type of model that I want to, to talk about a bit, again, are called bounded confidence models. Here, the opinions are continuous valued. And when two agents interact, if their opinions are close enough, they will compromise by some amount. This is where the bounded confidence comes in, the, the notion of being close enough. And otherwise, they will not. And so there's this underlying space of opinions, and then changes occur based on interactions. OK. So the first type of these is a threshold model. And a very well-known one is known as the Watts threshold model, though it, was, it actually predates, it predates um, Watts and was studied not on a network by, by Mark Granovetter, um, in the late 70s, and was also studied by people like Tom Valente with some network structure. And so then in, in, in parallel, um, in the computer science literature, uh, uh, Kempe, Kleinberg, and, and, and Tardush have a similar model, which is called the KKT model, which is also a threshold type. And these various models have been built on uh, for a couple decades. Well, a couple decades since, 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 those, since, since KKT and Watts. Um, there is a nice paper by James Gleason that talks about binary state models. Most of the threshold models have been studied are binary state. And it has a table that talks about, or the, the, the tabulates the update rules of how nodes change from zero to one for these different models. And in particular, um, in terms of the type of mathematics that can be used on these models, like some branching process like calculations and some percolation like calculations can be done on them, but it can be done on a number of different ones um, and so if you're interested in sort of the, the diversity of models that can be studied in a certain way, then, then that, that, that particular paper is a nice place to start. Okay, so the Watts threshold model <clears throat> per se. So let's su <clears throat> suppose our network does not change in time and each node, node J, has a threshold R sub J that's drawn from a distribution. And then each node can either be zero or one, where zero is like inactive or uninfected, and one is like active or infected. And we choose a seed fraction of nodes, um, perhaps uniformly at random, to be in state one at the beginning, and every other node is in state zero. Okay, you can also ch say choose exactly one node to be in state one at the beginning if you want, but sometimes people do that. And then you have, a, you have some update rule that I haven't explained yet, for how a node goes from zero to one. And you can either consider them synchronously, which means that for the updates that occur at time n, I look at the situation of the nodes at time n minus one, and I do this for every single node, and that will determine the updates that occur at time n. So this is known as synchronous updating. And then there's asynchronous updating, which effectively is a discretization of continuous time. And you use kinetic Monte Carlo or Gillespie um, to pick you know, which node you're going to consider. And you consider some nodes. You imagine that the time is this small time dt that only one node or some small number of nodes are changing. And then you apply the same update rule. So, so generically, these two types of things are different. But if the update rule itself is not stochastic, and you only have deterministic changes left, you'll get the same steady state as t goes to infinity, but you'll get different um, amounts of time to get there, um, and perhaps a different ordering of nodes to, to get there. Um, if there's stochasticity in the update rule, then you just have models that are completely different, including as t goes to infinity. Um, OK, and in the Watts threshold model, the update rule is I have my R sub J, which is some kind of inertia in terms of I have to overcome this inertia to, to change from zero to one. I look at the fraction of my infected neighbors. So I have a degree KJ. That's my number of friends or my number of neighbors. I have M of those that are infected. And then if I'm being considered for update, I become infected if this fraction is at least my, my threshold. And the different types of threshold models, basically, you either make the le or most of them, you either make the left hand side more complicated, or you make the right hand side more complicated. So there's quite a few papers out there, including stuff that I've spent time on, where you know the question is, you know, generalizing either this side of the of the inequality or that side of the inequality, you know, changes something in some interesting way. Let's explore the consequence of those changes. Right? There are many papers that have a flavor of that. Um, an important variant 
of the sort of basic one would be to have the active neighbors and the number of active neighbors instead of the fraction. And so if you have the number of active neighbors on the left hand side, so it's M only, now you're giving extra credit to, to nodes that have many friends. Right, and the dividing by k sub j, dividing by its degree, is to remove that credit. And so those are those are sort of two different things that one can build on. Um, this model um, has a monotonicity in the sense that once I go from state zero to one, I will forever remain in state one, and that's a very drastic assumption, uh, especially in terms of what this can reasonably represent in in something real. Um, it's an assumption that allows certain types of mathematical approaches to be used, in particular branching process approaches. And so this, this is something that is a big assumption, but is convenient to do math. There are some model, there are, there are some real life situations where it's not totally crazy, but you have to kind of think about it. Okay, so one of the things that one can look at are steady state levels of adoption. Um, so in particular, that means, suppose I'm starting with one node that's infected and everyone else is, is uninfected, which node I start with as infected will then affect, you know, how many nodes are infected as T goes to infinity. So in this particular example, I have, I have a very simplistic network, which has, I think, 13 nodes, and um, all, all nodes have the same threshold. So at least 30% of their neighbors need to be active when it's being updated for it to become active. And if I start with a single node in the middle as active and everyone else inactive, then the fraction of active nodes at the end is rho infinity because everyone eventually gets infected. If I start over here, sorry, I'm using active and, and infected interchangeably. If I start over here, five out of the 13 nodes, um, maybe it's more than 13. Anyway, five out of the nodes, yeah, I guess it's more than 13 because I can't count. Um, five out of the nodes become active at the end. If I start over here, two out of the nodes become active at the end. And the, the mathematical theories that people often use on this, um, for, with very few exceptions, most of those, of those approaches don't keep track of the, of, of the different initial conditions and they are doing an ensemble average and empirically they are doing a sample mean over different initial conditions. But, the, but once you have the initial condition, everything else is deterministic in this particular, well, the model that I showed you, for instance. Um, you, you can get approximations that are time dependent, but you know, figuring mapping out the space of initial conditions is not something that most of those methods that have been used to study these models are, are, are that good at. Okay. So one generalization that we did was to add hipsters to this. So this is work with Jonas Ewell, um, who started this work as a visiting master student with me when I was at Oxford. So, so actually, I think the first calculations for this paper were from like 2015 or something. So it took a while. Um, and he's now a postdoc with Steve Strogatz at Cornell and, and continues to work on. He has a new paper that just came out a couple of days ago on archive that you could take a look at. Um, and the idea is the following. We take the watch threshold model, and now there are two products. So it's not just from zero to one. You either go from zero to A or from zero to B. And I'm labeling them as A and B because I'm not thinking of one of them you know, being inherently better or worse than the other. I'm thinking of them as two options. And there's two types of individuals. There are conformist nodes, and those obey exactly the same rules that I told you before. Okay, they will adopt the majority opinion from their local neighborhood. So when they adopt, they'll just look at their local neighborhood and they'll adopt the majority opinion. And if it's tied, probably I'd have to look up exactly what we said, but if it's tied, maybe they just choose at random or something of the two. But the rule for when they adopt is the same as before and, and, they, and they use this local rule. A hipster node will choose to go from zero to one of the other states according to the same rule, but it will choose which state it goes to in a different way. And in particular, it will look at the best seller list for the full network. So we know how many nodes have A and we know how many nodes have B, but it will do it with a time delay, tau units ago. So we're actually doing discrete, we're using synchronous updating because that's more convenient for this setup. So things like discrete versus um, ver synchronous versus asynchronous updating, the choice often gets made based on just what's convenient for the problem that you're solving. 
basically. So it's going to be different choices and different papers for that reason. So they look at the bestseller list from how times ago, and they pick whichever one is less popular. Okay, and so the nodes are in advance chosen to either be a hipster or conformist, and it behaves in this manner. And then this picture is just meant to just be the to, to describe to just show in a picture what I said in words. Okay, so there are various things we do in the paper, but one of the interesting things that I want to point out, and this was actually the main thing that we were trying to do in the paper, was to you know devise a simplistic model such that generically the less popular product can win and the message behind that is is that people should be less surprised than they are when something that is a sort of anti-establishment or less popular product wins that it can happen generically much more often than people seem to think it doesn't mean that this is the mechanism this is a very toy mechanism but but i i feel like people are more surprised by this than they should be um so let me tell you a little bit of what's going on on the right. I'm not going to go through every single plot, but I will point out tau equals one. So bestseller list one time unit ago, bestseller list two time units ago, three, four, five, and six. So let's look at this tau equals five. The um, the red and the blue are the different products. So 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 red is the more popular product at the beginning, and blue is the less popular. And the vertical axis is rho infinity that I showed you before, the adoption fraction at steady state, right? So something could have everything perhaps. And the P hipster on the bottom is the um, probability that nodes are, 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 are hipsters, right? So, so we have um, a biased coin and we flip it and that gives the probability that they are, that they are hipsters, right? So here is zero hipsters completely. So only the more initially more popular product will win. And here are a small number of hipsters and so on. And this is a set of runs over what is known as a configuration model network. And in particular, it is a five regular configuration model network. Five regular means that every, every node has exactly five neighbors. Okay, so there's only one type of node. And configuration model says that I'm connecting these ends of the edges, these stubs, uniformly at random. So it's what's known as a random matching. And so each network that we run over is having these, these, these networks connected in this way. And you can get a diversity of structures from doing that. So we do, you know, we have different ones. So the, so the, so the vertical lines here are, are different runs from a different realization of, of, of the process. And one of the things that we see is that for P hipsters between say about 0.1 and about 0.4, that the less popular product you know, often wins more generically, the initially less popular one. And, and so there's this wide range of, of fractions and, and, you know, less than 50% where the, where, where the less popular one wins. Okay, and so there's various other results like that in the paper. So, so one interesting thing to ask is, you know, how can something like this occur? So this is where this plot on the left comes in, which is on a different type of network, but will give you hopefully some intuition as to why it can occur. Um, so let's consider a Cayley tree. So this is this three tree that say goes off in infinity. And let's consider having a um, small fraction of hipsters. And suppose that for some realization, the hipster ends up over here, right? So we start at T equals one with a red product. And then there's this hipster, this hipster chooses blue and everybody else here after the hipster you know, if they're the ones chosen to update can end up choosing blue. So, so because of this bottleneck, you could get this entire branch choosing blue, even with a small number of hipsters, if it's in the right place, right? And this is just with a single hipster. Um, configuration model networks will have some of these things, some of these, some of these bottlenecks, not as many as, of course, as a tree. But the idea is that once you have some of these bottlenecks, a, a small fraction um, can influence a lot of things down the line. Of, of, of taking the less pop, initially less popular product. Okay, so that's, that's the intuition that you can actually generically get something along these lines with a less popular product even getting as high as 80% with only say a little more than 20% hipsters. Okay, so that's one thing that we did. And, 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 I, and I, you know, things like choosing good random graph models like a five regular configuration model network or, or looking at the dynamics on a tree, right? Social networks don't look like this but the idea is that we choose our graph structure in a way that's convenient 
that allows us to explore what certain models can do. And that's one of the things that people do a lot when they're studying these things, right? So that's, I was trying to be, I was trying to use those examples to be more concrete about, you know, choosing convenient structures to study these things on. Okay, so there's something called the voter model. The is um, in quotes because there's actually multiple variants of it that can have substantive differences. And if you want to get um, an introduction, especially of different ways and reality inspired rather than realistic. So, you, you know, you know, different generalizations are inspired by reality without being actually realistic. There's this really nice paper by Sid Redner um, in this journal that I had never heard of until I saw this paper um, that goes through a bunch of them and is a great way to start for voter models just to see different ways that people have played with it. And now here, everybody starts having some opinion, right? So you start with A or B, and then when, when there is a discordant edge, so that means the, the, the two nodes, there's an A that's, that's adjacent to a B, then you figure out, okay, how, does, how do the states change? You can again choose between asynchronous and synchronous updating. So you can also, and you can also then from that select a random node, perhaps uniformly at random, and then select a random one of its neighbors, right? So selecting a random node um, is one, and then selecting neighbor is one thing, but you could also select a random edge and then look at what, which of the two nodes on the end of it um, gets updated. Whether you first select a random node or you first select a random edge, those two are different and actually have different convergence rates. Um, and if you want some intuition for that, if I represent a, matri a network as an adjacency matrix, if I select a random node, I'm going to pick a random row and then pick a random column after that. If I select a random edge, I'm going to pick a random element of the adjacency matrix. And those two processes are generically different in terms of how long things can take to get to a steady state. Okay, so in a particular paper of ours, we use edge-based updates and in particular, the edges that can update are ones that are discordant. So an A adjacent to a B. And we use asynchronous updates. So we're then picking one edge and then we'll pick you know, one of the um, incident nodes from that edge to be, to be, to be updated. Okay. Um, this is co-evolving, so, or adaptive. So there's going to be some probability um, and this is sigma to the Q that they will choose to rewire. So if I have an A to a B and I'm choosing to that the node that's at A is going to be the one that may do something, it will have probability sigma to the Q to break this edge. And then with different strategies of what it would subsequently do from breaking the edge, it can either rewire to a random node, which could mean reforming the edge that I just broke, right? So it breaks and then reforms. It could rewire to the same, which means I look at all other nodes that it's not adjacent to that are of the same state and I pick randomly from those, or it could just rewire to none, which, which is something that we did that has not been studied as much, which is an unfriending. Um, when it comes to doing some mathematical approaches, the rewire to none is actually harder because you're not preserving um, the mean degree anymore. And some of the approximation methods require you to preserve the mean degree. So, so from certain, at least from the perspective of certain types of mathematical calculations, this one's actually harder. And I think that's why it's been studied less in terms of people trying to do mathematical approximations. This Q is our nonlinear parameter. The sigma is between zero and one. So in particular, as Q is larger, then I'm going to have a smaller probability of rewiring. So for larger Q, I'm more likely to get an update step of a node changing its opinion. And for smaller Q, I am more likely to get a rewiring step. Okay, so here's a schematic of a step just to remind you of what's happening. I have a discordant edge, which I picked. I have a one minus sigma to the Q um, probability. Of, of adopting, right? So then um, I wonder if I said the other backwards. Anyway, if, if Q is large, yes, yeah, so sigma is between zero and one. So if Q is large, I'm going to adopt. 
I may have said that. I don't know if I said that reverse before. Anyway, if Q is large, I'm going to adopt. If Q is small, I'm going to rewire. Um, and so adopting, this A turns into a B, and rewiring by one of those three strategies, you know, I get I get potentially some other edge. Okay, so right, Q is so Q is large, is more adopting. Okay, so here's a couple things we can do. Again, we put it on a convenient random graph model, and in this particular case, we're putting it on an error training model, um, GN. P. So, so every pair of nodes has a homogeneous independent probability um, P of having an edge between them and one minus P of, of not doing it. So, so the model rules don't have any preference, but then you would, you would, you would average over many realizations. Okay. On this, on the left, this is one of, there's many plots like this in the paper. On the left, we're plotting the terminal density of the minority state, whichever one it is. So it could be, you know, slightly less than 0.5, or it could be all the way down to zero in principle. Um, and we're doing this as a function of Q. So there's more adopting when we're on the right and more rewiring when we're on, on, on the left. And so when we're more rewiring, we get a minority state density that ends up being about 50%. And when we're adopting, we get one that's close to zero. It's not exactly zero. This is strictly above zero. And the reason is that when you rewire, some components are not there. There are there's not one component, and so you can have a different component of the network that has a different state, and and, and so this value gets small, but it gets to some value that's above zero. Okay, and then just to show you something from the same set of simulations, now we're plotting specifically the terminal density of state A, right? So state A will sometimes, and I should also say in this particular simulation, we started each node, we started the nodes, half of them were in state A half were in state B, okay? So we started them at 50-50, um, I should have mentioned that. Um, okay, so the terminal density of state A, you know, nodes will change many, many times and so on, regardless of whether A is majority or minority, so it's majority when it's here, it's minority when it's there, as a function of Q, right? So, so more adopting and more rewiring, and it's, you know, near 50-50 when it's, when it's, when it's um, rewiring. Um, the black, is the sample mean over say 100 simulations of, of what happened. And remember, we started at 50-50, right? So because we start at 50-50, if there's nothing that favors A or B, you could easily get an A or a B. So, so the black is the sample mean. So if I'm here, this is roughly gonna mean that close to 80% ended up at A at the end or, or at B. So blue is an individual simulation. So you've got a bunch of simulations where A wins, and you've got a bunch of simulations where B wins. And so black will tell you the relative fraction because then that's the sample mean. But you need the individual simulations to tell you the story because it's going to either be A winning or B winning. And then you have some kind of transition here, right? You have what may be a phase transition. I say maybe because we were doing this numerically rather than showing, you know, in some mathematical way, but you've got some kind of transition. And then you can make more complicated network structures um, these are built by using what are called stochastic block models with air to training blocks, but then the different probabilities and different blocks. And you can get more complicated transition structures as a, as a result of, of doing that. Okay. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and skip this, but just majority illusion versus in echo chambers and minority illusion is something you can do there. Very roughly speaking, what majority illusion means is that I sample my local neighborhood and it looks like say red is winning, but then if I, but, but, but I do that simultaneously while looking at the whole network and actually white is winning. And this can arise because of sort of inherent, you know, homophily, inherent similarity of what you're connected to. And so there are phenomena related to this that we studied in the, in the paper, the Correa Porter paper. Okay, so let me go to the third type of model that I want to um, bring up. And these are known as bounded confidence models. So totally different flavor model. Um, continuous valued opinions. We're again gonna have network structure that doesn't change. So, so, so we've gone through that interlude. And, and they're on some metric space. You have to be able to define a distance on this space. Um, and so for example, it might be between minus one and one. Not the only choice you can make. You can have also multiple dimensions and so on. So when two agents interact, so you choose them to interact. Um, if their opinions are sufficiently close, they compromise by some amount. So there's two parameters there already. There, what does it mean to be sufficiently close? That is some parameter. And the amount by which they compromise is another parameter. 
And then otherwise their opinions don't change. Though of course one can have variants, you know, people, people like you know, digging their feet in and having their opinions become more extreme or whatnot. And the best known variants, so one of them is the DeFont, DeFont Wise Book model uh, or DeFont et al model, or sometimes called just DeFont model. And this has asynchronous updating of the node states, right? So there's this pair that I'm thinking about. And, and the, other man, the other one is, is a hegselman krause model, which has a, um, a, a synchronous updating of node states. And now, um, you know, now, now there's more of a stochasticity in the update rules itself. Um, so, so this is something where just generically the models are different, but they're trying to get at, you know, certain things. Um, the, these simulations can get very long. And so, although I would say the Defont et al. model at some level is slightly more realistic because of asynchronous updating, those calculations can get really, really, really long. And so for that reason, it's often common to study Hegselman and Krause or a generalization thereof. Um, most of the studies of this have been without network structure. So everyone is connected to everyone else. And it's tended to be with a view towards studying consensus. Although the interesting thing is that that's not why these models were developed. The sort of original reason to develop these models, but something that has not been explored all that much in practice, um, although we're trying to change that, um, is, is how a small set of extremist ideas can enter into, into a system and, and somehow take over. And, and that was the motivation for some of these models. And so we're trying to go back in some of the work that we're doing. I mean, some is still looking at consensus. We're trying to go back and take a look at how that might happen with this kind of mechanism. Okay, so we have a paper from a few years ago um, from, from uh, Flora among my former undergrad at, um, and Robert Van Gorder and me. And we were looking at this in various types of networks and just picking different, very stylistic networks and, and asking, you know, what are some differences and what occurs in the different networks. And so the network structure is going to have a big effect on the dynamics, including how many opinion groups you form and also in how long they take to form. So we did the, de, we did a version of the default model. And so at each discrete time, we, we pick some pair of agents who are adjacent next to each other, and we compromise their opinion in amount that's proportional to the difference. And if not, they didn't change. And so then you can ask, well, well, does consensus occur? And more generically, how many opinion groups are there at steady state? And how long does it take to converge? And then how does this depend on the parameters and network structures? And one, one thing that we saw, again, numerically, for instance, is that the convergence time seems to have a transition with respect to this bound, uh, which indicates a compromise range. And so let me show you, well, the equations are here, but I'll show you, it'll be a little bit blurry, but I'll show you a zoomed in version of that. Apologies for blurriness. So here's agents I and J. I'm going to look at what, what their state is going to be in time T plus one as a function of where things are in time T. Okay, so I've got my state in time T and I look at the difference between my, my, my neighbor's state and my state. And if they're within this bound C, so that's one of the parameters that's my confidence bound, then I will compromise in an amount proportional, M is a proportionality to this difference. And otherwise I will stay the same. And then J will behave in an analogous way. Okay, so that's, that's just how this model works. So this is the toy version of this notion of, of, of bounded confidence. An example, sorry, there's very, very many panels on this plot, but let's look at this one over here. Um, the vertical axis is the confidence bound. So the higher I am on the vertical axis, the more I'm willing to compromise. And the horizontal axis is this multiplier M, which is the amount by which I'm willing to compromise. And we allow over compromise. So 0.5 is a, a compromise through half the space, and one would be allowing, you know, com a complete overcompensation. Um, and then this, the the color is a natural logarithm of the convergence time, and then we only simulate for a certain amount of time, and so there's a bailout time that if we go there, we just say, okay, well they haven't compromised by this amount of time that we pre-specified. Okay, so that's what division means. Okay, and so. It makes sense that if the compromise confidence bound is higher and you're willing to compromise when you're farther away, 
that you would that you would have a shorter convergence time because you're willing to compromise in more situations. So the thing we have here, and this is numerics, is that this curve actually there's now and it's a it's a paper that Susan Fennell and James Gleason and their collaborators did. They actually have an approximate expression for the particular curve um, that occurs here. Okay, so there's there's not much that's known analytically, but there's a little bit that's that's known. Okay, so a generalization of this, and I'm going to be conscious of time, but we started a few minutes afterwards, so I figure I still have a few minutes. Uh, so my, my former postdoc, Heather Brooks, who's now um, a faculty at Harvey Mudd, and I did this, um, we wanted to put in media nodes. So this is going to build on, on hexelman krause It'll be like hexelman krause like dynamics. Um, we now have discrete events, sharing of stories, and so people are interacting, say, with tweets, um, and they're going to share the tweet and also change their opinion if they're within the confidence bound and otherwise not, but this will influence them. And then, of course, by the act of sharing, this can then influence influence others. And you, you know, so there's this there's this um, value attached to what you know the item we share. And so then this is based this interaction is again based on a con a bounded confidence type mechanism. And we also have some examples that include a distance both in ideology space, which is the type of thing we were already talking about, and in the quality of content. So if something conforms to your ideology, maybe the quality of content can be lower and you'd still interact with it and share it and it still might change your opinion a bit. This model also includes media nodes that only have out edges. So we impose that they can never change their opinion. So if you wanted to think of them as zealots, you could. But you know, and then the question is, well, how easily can nodes like this um, that have perhaps extreme ideological positions influence opinions in a network? And then you can also put in this model sort of set up in a way that if you want to put in things like bots and sock puppets and so on, you can. Okay, so again, another blurry one, but just to show you one intuitive thing or one non-intuitive thing. Um, suppose that all the media nodes in a given in a given simulation have the same opinion as each other. Okay, so so you know simplification, and this is the number of media accounts on the on the vertical axis and the followers per media account on the on the horizontal axis, and then this color this R bar that I have not defined for you is a measurement of entrainment or or brainwashing. How much has the media moved the sort of average opinion in the network? And there's some formula in the paper that you can look at. And the thing that we see, and we see this actually for a broad swath of um, network structures, is that having maybe a moderate number of media accounts with a moderate number of followers per account, so there's this band where there seems to be a larger influence. And the basic idea is if it's too high and you influence it too quickly, there's less of a room, there's less room for it to spread to others. So this sort of allows a slow burn. We do not have a mathematical explanation of this. So it's numerics. So one thing that would be good to do is to somehow find a suitable approximation, maybe in a simplified setting, that, that, that allows you to actually get this um, mathematically. And, and given that this seems to be occurring very robustly across many network structures, it seems, it seems that there is something that's, um, you know, that's not so sensitive to some of the network structures that, that occurs a lot that would be interesting to look at further to really get a precise handle on it. Okay, so here's one of the simulations, one of the other simulations that we do. Um, this has both the, this now this example has both the ideology space and the quality space. So let's put opinion values between minus one and one, and let's put quality values between zero and one. And we use the um, version four, I believe, of the ad fontis media bias chart. And so these are values of both the opinions and the quality that were hand curated. And so we seed our dynamics with media nodes that have these opinions where the colors in this plot don't mean anything, just to help visual, visualize. And the size is proportional to the number of Twitter followers that their Twitter accounts had in a given day. Right, so like this one over here is like Infowars or something. It's all the way to the right, and it's kind of pretty low, um, or very low. Um, and we seed individual, we seed initial opinions of everyone else uniformly at random, in minus one to one. 
Okay, so people start there and they start some random place in the content quality. And so the idea then is what happens, so this is t equals one, two, five, 15, 25, and 122. By the end, we basically form two echo chambers, one of which is you know, sort of moderate content um, of reasonably high quality. And it's kind of coming from you know, this sort of area over here. And you can see some things, lots of followers around there. And then the other one is you know, pretty low quality of content and, and reasonably to the right, which is coming from around over here. Um, and you know, this is a very simplistic mechanism Right, it's a very simplistic mechanism, but it gives sort of plausible echo chambers. Okay, so I'm going to conclude and also just let you know a couple things that are kind of extensions of this. Some of which are, or one of which is already on um, available in public, and others of which we're finishing up the papers. Um, so first of all, you know, lots of cool stuff to study in opinion and spreading models. I've presented three different flavors of these models. There are more than just these three. Um, and a basic question that we've thought about in, 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 a, in a lot of these, although, you know, in somewhat different ways, depending on the style of model, you know, how does network structure affect some process on top of it? And of course, when people have been trying to devise, um, you know, policies and behavior to deal with COVID, that's also been an issue of, well, you know, let's, let's have, you know, sparser network structure to affect the dynamics, in that case of disease dynamics. So is there a consensus? How many opinion groups? How long does it take to converge and so on? And so then some of the current stuff. Um, so we've got a paper that's now in press at Siam Journal Applied Dynamical Systems that you can find on archive online. And this is to generalize bounded confidence models to hypergraphs. And so the idea there is that you've got polyadic interactions. So not just pairwise, but more than that. And there are going to be different ways that you can generalize a bounded confidence style mechanism for how you compromise. And um, in particular, um, in, in particular, you can actually get, at least the way that we generalize it, you can get this notion of opinion jumping that cannot occur in the pairwise models. You can actually get phenomena that are different. Um, we also are doing a generalization to adaptive bounded confidence models. So now the change in opinion is coupled to the change in network structure. An interesting thing here, and again, you have to choose how you want to do it, is that you know when we did the voter model, a discordant edge says, well, A is one node and it's adjacent to B is another node. For bounded confidence models, you have to define what it means to be discordant in the first place. So what we do is do a second confidence range, which has to be at least as large as the first confidence range. And that confidence range says, well, if this confidence range is too large, now I'm going to call this as discordant, right? But you have to actually define what it means to be discordant. Um, we also have a paper um, where we're looking at spreading cascades. So cascades are much more naturally defined, or at least more intuitively defined, maybe intuitive is better word than natural, for threshold models. But cascades would be like, you know, your opinion changes and things are cascading along Twitter, but this can happen in other models as well. And so this paper is, is a matter of, okay, how do we look at spreading cascades in this other style of model? Because that's something we want to use for comparison with empirical data at some point. Um, and then another one that we have in progress, although it's, it's a little bit farther behind the others, is to look at bounded confidence models on multi-layer networks, where the idea is that spreading is not just occurring on one type of edge, right? You've got Twitter, you've got Facebook, you've got phone calls. And so these opinions are spreading over a more complicated structure. And so therefore that's, that's more realistic, but then you need to somehow, you know, figure out how to get your hands on it to understand what's going on better. Okay, and that is, all I have on the slides. Great, thank you very much, Mason. Uh, if you have questions, please type them on the chat and I'll forward them to, to Mason. Uh, there's already one by Gabriel Ramos Fernandez. Uh -huh. uh, he, he asks, in models where node states depend on the perception of the majority state or even the global structure of the network, there is bound to exist a feedback between local and global properties. Does this feedback always lead to a steady state or can there be a runaway process with no stable equilibrium point? Um, this would depend on, on the model. The situation that I showed, which was with modification of a Watts threshold model, because of the fact that when people go from say state zero to A or B, that they never change, um, 
this one is guaranteed to eventually have a steady state because you're going to get to a point where everyone is either at A or B or, or, or no longer can change. And so that one can get to a steady state. That one has to get to a steady state because of the way the model in particular is constructed. But most generically, you would not have to have one. But it's just yeah. that model is just constructed in a very special way. I, I remember that um, the Axelrod model of opinion formation, which basically is on a, on a grid, um, it, it was shown that it exhibits this uh, slower is faster effect. In the sense that if um, the opinion is updated too frequently, it never converges. Right. And so, so you have to, to slow down your change of, of opinion because if you are changing opinion, then your neighbor will change opinion and right. if they change, you right. will change that. Right. I, I, wonder, I mean, yeah, I mean, I wonder the, the, um, the, 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 let me show you the plot. I mean, it's possible that a slower is a factor, faster effect might help explain this because one of the reasons that moderate ones are dominating is because otherwise things change too much too quickly. And, and, and then because it's bounded confidence, people are no longer willing to update with each other. You know, so, I mean, we don't, we didn't think of it as slower and faster. This was more amount of change, but somehow the balance may, may have a similar, ex, you know, I mean, the, the intuition has some, some similarities to it. And so that may be a perspective actually that's useful to look at, at this. Um, I, I, we haven't done it, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I wonder whether people in marketing are doing similar type of research in order to know how can they may make us depend on things that we don't know right. that they're necessary so i don't I mean, know if they're i don't know if they're doing that i mean the thing is we're taking a much more mathematical approach in that we're actually trying to generalize the generation the generative mechanisms themselves and i know that when i see a lot of work in computer science they tend more for instance to take models that have been you know, studied for a long time, maybe even using an SIR model from diseases, and they're not, and they're doing things that are very data centric. And the thing is, I think that the models themselves, I think the mechanisms themselves need improvement, and that that has gotten a lot less attention. Um, and, and, and so I'm not sure if the marketing people are doing this, because I suspect they have a lot more people with a computer science or sort of big data type flavor. And so the approach that they may be taking to these problems you know, because I think that the modeling approach is going to be very helpful for what you're doing. Um, I mean, one thing that other, the, the, or I mean, that people do in terms of like um, the sort of extremism stuff can work this way. You know, you don't show, if somebody is perhaps susceptible in, to, to, to extremist views, you don't show them the horribly racist thing first, right? You show something that's a little bit out of their comfort zone. And then you show something that's a little more out of their comfort zone. And then you show something that's a little more out of the comfort zone, which is the same type of mechanism that you're bringing up, right? It's nope. not, in that case, they're marketing extremism as opposed to marketing some product that would hopefully be more innocuous, but you know, you have to show it a little bit at a time or else it never works. Yeah. Yep. Right. I mean, so, so there are people who think in these directions, um, whether the people doing marketing of products are among them, I'm not sure because I think there's not necessarily, there's not necessarily this obvious progression, right? Because the notion of extremism and opinions, you know, there, there's a notion of distance between them. But if I say product one or product two, you know, is there necessarily as obvious a notion of product two being a more extreme version that you have to warm up and do? Maybe for some products, but not, not all the time, right? Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if they're doing it, but I think it's, it's sort of less clear, it's less clear how much there's a benefit of, of, of doing that versus other things they could be doing. Yeah, well, okay. So if you have more questions for Mason, you can contact him by, by email. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing uh, screen, I guess then. <laughs> yes, yeah, so in three weeks, no, four, well, um, well the, there's another question. Oh, there is a question. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, the thing that general mechanisms are uncovering in monolayer networks would be important in multiplex networks, or is Do there I... a qualitative difference? 
Um, okay, so this is an interesting question. And, and actually, I'm, I will briefly share my screen again because I'm going to make a, a particular point related to that. Um, so in general, they can be different. That being said, sometimes what ends up happening is that you end up with a more complicated version of what you had before, but not something that has new effects. And you really have to work to make sure that it does. But there are examples where it does. It's just that it's not obvious. And in fact, this last paper here, the reason it's taking a bit longer is that what was originally happening with our, with our work is that we were just getting more complicated things that already occurred in monolayer networks. And although the mechanism is more realistic, because of course we do have more than one social media platform, if the phenomena are the same, then it's like, okay, well, you've made the model more complicated, but have you learned anything more in the process? Um, and so, you know, we had to really search over the types of network structures to figure out, you know, when does the multiplexity actually give you a difference? And, and so that's something that, you know, you know, is really on the burden of the researcher to do when you make your model more complicated, you want to make sure to develop an understanding of which of those complicated structures actually affect the qualitative behavior, right? But it does in general, but not always. And you have to figure out when it does and when it doesn't and only make your model more complicated if you're actually learning something by doing it because otherwise you've just made it more complicated. And yeah, it's a very important question. Thank you for asking that. Especially since it's, you know, one of my projects is literally taking longer because of exactly that. Yeah, great. Well, I, I invite everyone to join us in our next colloquia. We'll have uh, presentations by Jessica Clack, Dashon Wang, David Wolpert, and Tina Eliasirat, and others to, to be confirmed. So uh, you, you can follow social networks of uh, C3, uh, and you will find announcements there. Okay.